She trained in geriatrics and general medicine in London and then developed a special interest in perioperative care um, of old adults. Um, she works now in geratology and perioperative medicine, mostly based at the JR, um, and she is the secretary of the perioperative care special interest group of the British Geriatrics Society. She is passionate about clinical education. She's already published a book on medical teaching skills for doctor and finished a master's in clinical education. She's also the author of the Older Persons module of the UCL Perioperative Care Master's Program. So, Ashwita, delighted to have you in the surgical den. Thank you. So, I'll be talking to you about what frailty is and what frailty is not, um, common models of frailty, why it matters, its measurement and its assessment, going through some cases, and how we design perioperative care services for the frail patient. And finally, what's going on here at OUH at the moment. Most importantly, hopefully by the end of this talk, I will convince you that rather than thinking of frailty as an afterthought just before the patient goes into the operation or unfortunately after the operation, to think of it early on in the older surgical patient. So, if we look at this slide, I think we can all agree that these are old people, but they are not all frail. So frailty is not just chronological age. I think we can agree that if the patients on the right turned up on your operating table, you'd be quite happy. So the chap on the upper right-hand side is Fauja Singh. He did his last marathon at the age of 101. And um, the lady down on the right-hand side is the oldest uh, skydiver in the world, and she's 86. Actually, the lady on the left is the youngest patient on this slide, and she's 76. But I think all of us in the room would agree that she may be frail. So I would say at the extremes of frailty, we're all actually quite good at identifying people. But it is the grey area in between that we struggle with. And that's where hopefully we can be of help going forwards. So what is frailty? As a concept, it's been around for a few decades. It's complex and it's quite poorly understood as a syndrome. And what it is is decreased physiological reserve. And it's across multiple organ systems. One of the best definitions, and as I say, there are many, which makes it a very difficult area to look into, it's a conditional syndrome which results from multi-system reduction in reserve capacity to the extent that the number of physiological systems are close to or past the th threshold of symptomatic clinical failure. And as a consequence, that frail person is at increased risk of becoming, uh, having disability and death from what is a very minor external stressor. And there are lots of overlap syndromes with it as well. So with sarcopenia, cachexia, disability, and comorbidity. I think the simplest analogy I can find often when I'm speaking to students and people that just can't grasp quite what frailty is, is the game of Jenga. So as you know, it's a solid tower at the beginning and you take away a block at a time and it becomes more and more unstable to the point that if you take away one block at the very end, that whole tower will come tumbling down. And that is very similar to what happens in frailty. Long-term chronic illnesses, unsupported social situations, dementia, delirium, depression, social isolation, all blocks in this Jenga. And as you take them away, when the patient has them, you end up with a very unstable patient at the end, where a very small stressor, which may be a urinary tract infection, a fall, or in fact a surgical procedure, brings this tumbling block down and has life-changing consequences for the patient. And this graph demonstrates that fragility. 
So a minor illness in a fit older person can result in functional disability, but they recover back to independence. But you take a frail older person and they drop into that dependence part of this graph and may recover back into independence, but not to the level that where they were before. So what are the models of frailty? So there's a phenotypic model. That's what Freed in 2001 described, and that's the relationship between five criteria, unintentional weight loss, grip strength, fatigue, gait speed, and low physical activity. And if you don't have any of those things, you're considered to be robust, and if you have one or two, pre-frail, and three to five, frail. And then another model that was described is the deficit accumulation model, and that was by Rockwood in 2005. And this has 70 different domains, not very user-friendly, mainly sits in the research domain, as you can understand. <laughs> um, but essentially looking at deficits in all these areas. But what these earlier models failed to identify was the elephant in the room, which is cognitive and social frailty. And they didn't really put enough emphasis on those. Actually, they have a synergistic relationship with physical frailty, and they are associated with the same adverse outcomes. And you put the two together, and you have bad news. So as you can see, the blue, uh, the blue line is a fit patient, and the green line is a frail patient, and you add in delirium, cognitive impairment, and all those survival data go down. So frailty is not only a physical dimension with respect to weight loss and, and muscle strength, but a psychological dimension when it comes to memory, anxiety, depression, and also a social phenomenon of older people who are living alone, are less supported. But why does it matter to a group of surgeons? Our population is aging. I think we are all used to seeing these pyramids at uh, many talks, but we are going from a pyramid shape to a kite and now to unfortunately what looks a bit like a coffin. <laughs> and the rates of surgical procedures that are occurring in older people is increasing year on year. In 2005, 1.5 million people above the age of 75 underwent surgery in England. In 2015, that had increased to 2.5 million. So the rate of increase is huge. And, and that is a mixture of credit to you as surgeons with more, co more uh, complex procedures and, and more intricate procedures that you can do on the older population in a more minimal way, but also our aging population. How common is it in different surgical populations? Well, we know that it is more common with age, although it's not the same as chronological age. It's more common in women, and it's more common in a low, lower socioeconomic group. And there's very variable reporting because of the difficulties with its definition in surgical populations. But I would say invariably the vascular population and the orthopedic population are where its prevalence is the greatest. So hitting about 50% in those areas. And when it comes to post-operative outcomes, it's bad news. It's an independent risk factor for morbidity, for mortality, both at 90 days and at 30 days, longer lengths of stay in hospital, and institutional discharge. So therefore, identifying it before the operation risk stratifying that patient, taking it into account when you're having a discussion with the patient and consenting that patient is really important. And from our perspective, identifying modifiable risk factors to improve the post-operative outcome if we can, and reduce the complications of surgery, which in these patients, to be honest, are often not surgical, but medical. Now, which frailty to tool to use? This is the million dollar question. Um, there are lots of surrogate markers, so things like grip strength, gait speed, which 
can, they're quick and easy to do, they're quite reproducible, you can see them being used quite well in a pre-operative assessment clinic. But it's very difficult using those to think what we modify about that patient to improve them prior to theatre. You've got scales and indices which, such as the Edmonton Frail Scale, the Clinical Frailty Scale, um, which are more in depth. And then you've got very surgery specific scores as well. And then you've got disease specific scores. And there's a lot of work going on around biomarkers currently. So things like CRP, IL-6, for example. And to be honest, the scores and the markers keep coming. There was a time in geriatrics, to be honest, if you wanted to be rich and famous, it was to come up with a frailty score. <laughs> I missed that boat. <laughs> So the Edmonton Frail Scale is probably my favourite, and I'd say amongst my perioperative colleagues that are all sitting over there, um, it, it usually is. It's slightly more complex. It's uh, 17 points in total, but it's divided into domains. So as you can see, there is cognition as a part of it. There's general health status. There's independence, your social support, medication. And those domains give you some idea about what to modify prior to an operation. What's probably the most popular is the clinical frailty scale. And this is now used um, in the major trauma best practice tariff. So this is the scale they've chosen. And although it was originally designed for physicians that are trained in comprehensive geriatric assessment, um, it, and then is not validated in perioperative care specifically, it is a good tool that's excellent for screening and its pictures make it very easy to use. It's available as an app on your uh, phones and iPads as well. And finally, the electronic frailty index, just to mention this. This is an automated frailty score and it's something that's generated in primary care from the patient's electronic records. It's been operationalized in the GP contract 2017, 2018. So if you look at GP printouts in detail, it is something that um, will appear on um, some of their diagnoses. And it provides GPs with a steer towards clinical and medication reviews, discussing falls and, and geriatric syndromes and, and frailty syndromes in these patients. But it's something that is happening in, in primary care and you may spot on your referrals if you get them in from primary care. So how is frailty managed by a geriatrician? I don't know how many of, her, how many of you have heard of CGA stands for Comprehensive Geriatric Assessment, and I would argue that's how we, as a specialty, deal with frailty. I don't like the term Comprehensive Geriatric Assessment because I actually don't like all three aspects of it. Comprehensive makes you feel like, does it last 10 minutes? Does it last 10 hours? What does, how long will this process actually take? And I would say it varies from patient to patient in reality. Geriatric makes it sounds like, sound like only a geriatrician can do it, and I would argue that it is a multidisciplinary process and actually something we need to train other specialties in with respect to aspects of it. And assessment makes it sound like we simply just find problems and don't do anything about them, but actually what it is is a process of actually making a problem list and coming up with solutions that are bespoke to a patient and then it is an iterative process that you revisit. And it is evidence-based and has been proven in the perioperative care arena. So I thought probably the best way to demonstrate what we do as a perioperative medicine specialty with dealing with frailty is to go through a case. And I've chosen hip fracture because actually if you look back at the history, it's one of the best demonstrations of where good frailty, older surgical care um, is well established now. So Mrs. LB comes to the emergency department at midday. Um, she's referred to the trauma team. 84 year old lady lives on her own, has broken her hip. She comes with baggage. She has dementia. She's had episodes of syncope. She has uh, on warfarin for her AF, has urinary tract infections and is anemic. These are her observations when she arrives. She has an ejection systolic murmur, 
that you could postulate the anesthetics team might be a bit worried about. They take all her bloods. Her hemoglobin's only 70, it's usually 85. Her INR is up, she's on warfarin. She's consented for surgery. She gets IV paracetamol. She gets IV vitamin K at the front door. She gets IV fluids, laxatives, and a fascia like a block is given in order to spare the number of opiates she gets and hopefully reduce the amount of delirium she has in the longer term. The also geriatric team see her at 1500 hours preoperatively. She is recognized to previously having delirium, recurrent falls, um, Four-month history of lightheadedness and several episodes of this a day. She's admitted a week ago, actually, for a loss of consciousness, and she's awaiting a 24-hour tape. Her baseline ECG is showing that she has AF. So what is our CGA perioperative medicine plan? So we recognize that she's high risk for delirium, and we commence her on some haloperidol, because actually when she had delirium on her previous admission, it was extremely distressing for her and, um, and her family. And... The discussions around that had this time the haloperidol helped last time, so we start it at the front door. From a cardiac and syncope perspective, there is worry from the anaesthetist, but we agree that this should be investigated post-op and it shouldn't delay her surgery. There's a risk of acute kidney injury that's recognized, so we stop her ACE inhibitor and we stop the NSAIDs that the GP had started recently. When you look back at the history, her anemia is chronic and we give her two units of blood with thruzomide cover, but a range of a 6 a.m. bloods the following morning, but pushed the investigation of that anemia to outpatient. And for an osteoporosis perspective, we commence her on some medication in the form of denosumab um, because she's had reflux. We start to think about a rehab flat plan at the very beginning. She's likely to need community hospital, and we put in plans for that when she arrives. And our nurse specialist goes through with her her wishes around resuscitation, advanced care planning, and have a chat to her family about what usual hip fracture care looks like. So the anaesthetists are happy in the morning. Her INR is less than two. Her hemoglobin is 10. She goes and has her dynamic hip screw at nine o'clock. She returns to the ward, and she gets mobilized on day one post-op and she has an OT assessment and a plan for rehabilitation put in place. We see her post-operatively. Post-operative bloods are reviewed, her catheter is removed on day one, her delirium is assessed, pain relief is reviewed, and her syncopal episode begins to be investigated. This is her baseline ECG, and we do carotid sinus massage and find that actually she pauses. Her pacemaker is inserted the following day under cardiology. And on day six, she's discharged to a community hospital. And by day 12, she's back in her own home. So hopefully that can demonstrate from an inpatient emergency perspective what we can contribute to the frail older patient. Now, the second case is not from this trust because we don't do any elective work yet. <laughs> but um, this is a vascular case that I was involved in. So this is a 79-year-old patient due for an open repair of a AAA, 7.8 centimeters, and surgery is due for the next few days after assessment in clinic. His known comorbidities at that point are just hypertension and macular degeneration. There's concern, however, from the surgeon that there are other things going on, and the anaesthetist is worried, and so we assess the patient. We identify a number of other comorbidities. Baseline ECG looks ischemic. He's also been having syncopal events. He's a heavy smoker and is breathless, and he's hyponatremic on his baseline bloods. It's decided that we should delay surgery. The next few days isn't appropriate. <clears throat> and we go through that process of comprehensive geriatric assessment and make a list of the morbidities and problems we identify look at investigating them. So the syncope, the 24-hour tape shows that he has non-sustained VT, and it's planned in conjunction with the cardiologist that he gets an implantable defibrillator after his surgery. He has an ischemic ECG, and we uh, arrange a myocardial perfusion scan in the next week. He has an angiogram, but nothing is amenable, particularly to stenting. His dyspnea is thought to be secondary to COPD, which wasn't recognized 
He started on inhaler therapy and given smoking cessation advice. Cognitive impairment is recognized, and I would say this is one of the most important things we do, and it's often missed, um, unfortunately, in particularly the vascular population where prevalence of it is greater. He has a CT head that shows that there is just small vessel disease, and he gets referral to the memory clinic, and most importantly, gets discussion and liaison with him and his family around delirium. And the hyponatremia is investigated, and it's a drug cause, and his thiazide is stopped. We go through these comorbidities that have been identified, we treat them, and we go through shared decision-making aids about what is the best way forward for this patient. So rather than having an open repair, he undergoes an EVAR and three weeks after that initial assessment by us. He has a planned ICU stay without cardiac, renal, or post-operative delirium, actually, so gets away lightly. He has an implantable defibrillator inserted after the vascular surgery and is discharged to his own home with a five-day length of stay. So hopefully those cases demonstrate to you how we can deal with aspect, identify aspects of frailty, deal with them, and modify them to some extent. I would agree that at an extreme of frailty, there may be little that can be added. But I would say in that gray area, there is aspects of frailty that we can look into, be it nutrition, be it exercise, be it drug modification, or the psychosocial aspect of their care. So how should perioperative care services be designed for frail patients? I think comprehensive geriatric assessment must be a part of it. We need to optimize comorbidities, look at aspects of prehabilitation with our anesthetists, identify and ad address things like malnutrition and anemia, and identify and reduce risks of delirium. And we can often help with complex issues around ethics and consent as well. And post-operatively, which is what you probably are more used to us seeing on the wards, is that aspect of shared clinical working and decision-making by doing joint medical and surgical ward rounds, for example, like we do on vascular, proactive recognition of post-operative complications, like I said, that are often medical in these patients rather than surgical, setting appropriate ceilings of care early on, um, mobilizing patients early, that delirium management, and good communication with the whole multidisciplinary team and relatives. So what's happening here at OUH? As I said, as in most places, hip fracture care was one of the first to be established. So back in 2011, Claire Pulford, who's sitting in the audience, <laughs> um, worked on our hip fracture service and established that. Um, Maggie Hamsley established our emergency surgical service, and we were probably one of the first in the country to have um, an SEU service, as we did with a physician integrated into it. Um, our TAVI service started back in 2013, and it's something that we've expanded on um, recently. And in the last year, we've expanded quite significantly, taking on vascular surgery earlier this year, mainly working with, as I said, the emergency vascular patients and not the elective ones yet. And we've expanded into major trauma rather than just hip fractures. who are our perioperative medicine team. There's a gaggle of them sitting there on the right-hand side. <laughs> um, so um, we have, we're quite unique in Oxford in that we're not only geriatricians. Um, Josephine and David, um, so David's a renal physician and, and Josephine has a respiratory HDU background as well and is acute medicine. Um, and our two new recruits, Christina and Katie, are down on the left-hand side. And our most exciting development have been our perioperative fellows. So we've been successful in, in um, recruiting three perioperative care fellows that started in the trust in August. And that is an ongoing um, process, and we hope to recruit three more in the coming year. And uh, Lauren works on major trauma, Nathan in vascular, and um, Fiona in general surgery. And where are we headed from a perioperative medicine service perspective? Well, 
At the moment, we are mainly based at the JR. And as I said, we, we have grown our services in the emergency um, surgery arena, so be that trauma or vascular. Um, it's difficult being split site, but having the perioperative care fellows and expanding our consultant base will help us hopefully in the not too distant future to expand to the Churchill Hospital. Fiona's been working on the elective colorectal um, population and doing a pilot across at the Churchill. Um, we are currently business casing up what we can do at the Nuffield Orthopaedic Centre with respect particularly to the problematic patients with periprosthetic fractures that are very difficult to manage and have longer lengths of stay. Um, expanding what we do here at the JR site as well. And most importantly, becoming an integrated part, hopefully in the future, of the preoperative assessment process. So working with David Hallsworth and his team um, about how we plug into that high-risk anaesthetic clinic. Because I agree there are a proportion of patients that need fancy anaesthetic assessment in the form of the CPET, et cetera. But there are a proportion of patients that end up in that clinic that actually need comprehensive geriatric assessment and optimization. So, I would argue that frailty is one of the most problematic expressions of population aging at the moment. It's that loss of physiological reserve, that Jenga tower, having blocks taken out and becoming extremely unstable. It exists on a spectrum, and at its extremes, it's relatively easy to identify and, and, and manage, but actually it's the gray area in between where we can hopefully help. It's very common in your surgical population. The frail older patient is going to be on your surgical table, whether you like it or not. <laughs> there are multiple scoring systems that exist that all have their merits and drawbacks. But actually, what you use and what you do is, is probably slightly academic. But the fact that you're thinking about frailty and thinking about referring that patient on or getting better management for particular aspects of it is what's important. These patients need a multidisciplinary approach and CGA, so that comprehensive geriatric assessment is a key part of it. And I hope that most importantly by the end of this, rather than frailty being an afterthought and a worry when the patient's in a horrible pickle post-operatively, I can bring it to the forefront of your minds and we can help you going forwards how to manage it. Thank you.